Thank you, Dr. Barrier. And please, please, please don't hear him say that because we're targeting MDiv students that this doesn't apply to you. Uh, this is one of those where all of us uh, can benefit and, and that kind of thing. Now, uh, had the privilege of speaking first week of chapel and, and tried to paint a picture of, of, of a vision that we have for the student body, the, uh, the idea that we want you to be striving for excellence in everything you do. Our vision is that as you leave here, you're going to be this effective communicator of the gospel, that you're ready to do real-world ministry. And there are a number of things involved in equipping the student body for that. And you're going to be working with the brethren. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, and, and the thing about the brethren is sometimes they have uh, expectations that can frustrate. In this room, a number of years ago, Lonnie Jones was here, and he was doing a weekend seminar for youth ministers. It was really, really good. He, it was all recorded, and I listened to those tapes over and over. But one of the stories that he told was about his first job as a youth minister. And he was living in a house that the church owned. It was across the parking lot from uh, the, the church building. And so he, he dives in with great enthusiasm in this first ministry, and so hadn't been working too long, and one of the leaders came to him. I don't remember if this church had elders or not. I don't remember how he told the story. But this person said to him, Lonnie, uh, when you're going over to be in the office to work, you might want to move your car over there just so that uh, the brethren, if they drive by, they'll know you're at work. Well, Lonnie is a young, compliant youth minister trying to be a team player, and so it sounds a little strange, but he starts moving his car over to the church building. Well... Hadn't been doing that maybe a week, and some, another church leader comes by and says, Lonnie, you do realize that when you drive your car across the per church parking lot, it kind of makes you look a little bit lazy. And so now he's like, well, which do I do? You know, because sometimes uh, the expectations were not always on the same page. And so it's going to be fun. But there are some things that a well-trained minister needs to be thinking about and you need to be doing everything within your power to never give the brethren a reason to disregard your ministry. And, and there are some things you can do to protect yourselves. Now, there are some expectations like that. People aren't going to communicate. You can't guard yourself against everything, but you can control some things. And, and so that's part of what we want to talk about today. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. This is Paul writing to young minister Timothy and he says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. That is Paul saying to Timothy, don't give the brethren a reason to disregard you as a minister just because you're not as old as you one day will be. And so an example in everything, yes, but we want to focus on one area today, and that is financial matters as a minister, and, and I'm thankful that uh, Jeremy has asked me to speak into that. We get a lot of calls for preachers. Church calls, they assume we've got somebody ready for them, or we know somebody that's ready to come and preach for them, and we want to be able to recommend people. I had a call not too long ago. It's been several years now, but this church was calling because their church, their preacher had conducted himself in such a way that he had given their church a bad name in the community. How many of us enjoy paying taxes? I don't see hands. But we do that, don't we? This particular preacher had chosen to just not do that. And finally the IRS called the church and said, we're getting ready to go through you if you don't do something about your preacher. Well, that has a way of getting out in town, and so when they called, they were in a bit of a mess. Now, this is important stuff. If you do not, um, have you not subscribed to the Jenkins Institute, Dale Jenkins, who's on our board, his brother Jeff, they do a lot of things to serve preachers. They do surveys, they provide resources, they provide encouragement. He's a great, those are two great guys to get to know, to network with. They'll help you find a church at some point. One of the surveys that Dale and Jeff conducted just recently, the survey was one question, and you had to answer where it most appropriately applied to you. And the statement was, as a minister, I live, and then you had to make a choice. And there were 227 responses to this survey. 
And so the first choice was, as a minister, I live on credit. I do not earn enough to make it. And it's an anonymous survey, and he's trying to find out, okay, where are preachers financially? Well, 3% of the survey of the responding people said, I don't, I don't make enough. I basically live on credit. I'm not earning enough money to make it. Now, I'd like to interview those guys to find out if that's really true or not, but, but that's not a good place to be. The second choice was, as a minister, I live paycheck to paycheck. That means if $10 came in this week, $10 goes out, there is no room for error. I mean, it is in and out. That's, that's how it goes. 20% of the respondents said, yes, I live paycheck to paycheck. The third choice was, as a minister, I live perilously, perilously close to the edge. And he didn't really define that, but 15% said that. And that means, to me, that means you cannot afford for one thing to go wrong. Everything's good as long as the pipes don't freeze up, or everything's good as long as the refrigerator doesn't break. Some of you are very young, but I'm sure all of us are old enough to realize is something going to go wrong? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when something goes wrong, we need to be prepared for that. So if you look at the numbers, 38%, almost 40% of the respondents are in a place where they are not in a good position to focus on ministry. In other words, if day by day I am really, really worried about money, and the idea that, man, I sure hope nothing goes wrong today because if something goes wrong today, it's going to be financially disastrous. If that's where my thinking is day to day, there is no way I can focus my mind adequately on my work. 40%, that's not good. Uh, the survey went on. As a minister, I lived where I could go a month without being paid. If they didn't pay me this month, would I, would I be okay? 13% said, yeah, I could do that. Uh, another response was, as a minister, I have three months' worth of income saved. Uh, that's what this guy recommends. 15% uh, of the respondents say, yeah, that's, I've got three months put back. That's a really good thing. 33% uh, said, hey, as a minister, I have learned to live within my income, and I'm comfortable. And, and I thought that was a good response there. And then he I don't know if he does this stuff for fun or what. His last choice was, as a minister, I am independently wealthy. And now maybe that's a trust fund minister. You know, you inherited the money, you've got money, you don't have to worry about it. One percent said, yes, that's me. And so the survey results say to me that when we talk about these kinds of things in chapel, you're not going to get a grade on it, but you are going to get graded by the church on it once you're working with them. And so it is important. Uh, Dave Ramsey, uh, I hope you like to read stuff that you're not assigned to read, but this little book called The Total Money Makeover, it's good reading. It'll bless you. Uh, what Dave Ramsey says he's going to do is he's going to talk to you about managing your money the way your grandma would teach you to manage your money. Very common sense sort of things, but one of the things he talks about is acting your wage. You, you understand the idea. Some people will live, and they will try to live at a level that their income does not support. And he says that is the recipe uh, for disaster. And as a minister, as a preacher, mishandling your money will kill your ministry. If you talk to a banker, and this isn't to be depressing, it's just to be factual, when you ask a banker which profession, which group of people do you not really want to see coming in and asking you for a loan, who is the last group that the banker uh, wants to see coming in and asking for a loan? Why? Well, yeah, the preacher is the answer. The, the banker is going to give you that answer. And the sad thing is, my belief is a few guys have gone out and created a bad stereotype for a lot of guys. But it is sort of a reality. Some guys out there have gone and borrowed money, not paid it back, and so now the banker's like, yeah, when a preacher shows up, we've really got to check that guy out to make sure he's going to be able to pay it back. When we're talking with churches and elders and they're like, well, how should we conduct our search? Are there some tips that you would give us? One of the things we'll say is, well, hey, if you're interested in this guy, tell this guy you're going to run an Equifax background check on him. 
And if that preacher's face gets red and he goes into a panic when you say you're going to run a check on him, he's probably not the preacher you want because he's probably got a lot of trouble in his past. I was an accountant before I was in ministry. So if an, a company's going to hire me to come and work with them, I'm going to be in, I'm going to be dealing with finances. I'm going to be on the, dealing with the books and all that sort of thing. And so it was not uncommon for the company to say, well, we're going to run a background check on you. Makes sense to me. I'm going to be playing with your money. You kind of need to know what you're getting. And, and so we tell churches, check a guy out. And so if you've got problems in your past that you're trying to fix, if you go into interview with the church, uh, financial matters wise, one of the things that would be wise for you to do is to disclose. So many bad things happen between elders and preachers because there's not good communication. So you go in, you're much further down the road if you say, I I've had some trouble in my past, but these are the things that I've done to work on that. So if you run a check on me today, it's, it's, it's going to show some trouble here, but these are the things that I'm doing, and I intend to keep working in the right direction. You communicate that, you're in a much better place. The, uh, the negative consequences of not managing your money well some of them are these. If the church begins to understand that you don't know what you're doing with your money, are they still going to listen to you when you get up to preach? You've given them a reason to kind of disregard your ministry, haven't you? Or Another negative consequence, if the congregation kind of becomes an eyesore in the community, especially in a small town, see if I'm the preacher in a small town and I'm working with the church, but then in town I go to this store, I go to Travis's store and I set up a line of credit with Travis and I start not paying Travis and then I go to Dr. Barrier's store and I set up a line of credit with him and I start not paying him. In a small town, how long does it take for everybody in town to know that I'm running up bills that I'm choosing not to pay. And then everybody sees me and they're like, yeah, that's that preacher from over there at the Church of Christ. And then when some faithful member from the church goes and knocks on somebody's door and says, you know, I'd really love you to come to church with me. And they say, but isn't your preacher the guy who doesn't pay anybody in town back? You see what it does? It, it, it not only makes me look bad, it has the potential to make the, the church look bad. You also become not recommendable. Church calls Travis and says, hey, this, this guy's talking to us about um, coming to work here. And, and Travis, for whatever reason, knows that this has been an issue. Can he recommend you openly? And then you're on the move again. And your family's looking at you like, man, we sure wish we could stay somewhere more than three years. Surveys say that your best work will be done with a church in what year of your ministry with that church. Anybody want to guess? Anybody looked at surveys? Five's close. I, yeah, seven is what I've seen. But, but in that five to seven range, yes. Think how long it takes to get to year seven. But, but the thought from the survey was your best relationship begins to occur with the church in year seven. How many ministries never make it to year seven? It's an interesting thing. So what can you do now? I mean, that's the real question with the few minutes that we have left. What can we do now? We, we've got MDiv students. They're working with churches now, already in ministry, so maybe some changes to be made there. But some of you are young. You're still in school. Here's one big suggestion. Learn how to handle money now while you don't have much of it. If you're making $50 a week right now, would it still be smart to have a plan for that money? And if you've got $50 a week right now and you develop a plan for that money, when that 50 becomes 250 and then that 250 becomes 500, if you've already gotten in the habit of having a plan for what you're going to do with your money, that habit will serve you well. So if you don't have a lot of money now, go ahead and start using it, planning for it now, and then it'll bless you later on. Uh, a budget. And if you don't know how to make a budget, there are people on this campus who will help you do that. Now, we're not going to walk through the nuts and bolts of that today, but in essentially in a budget, if I know I've got $50 coming in, how much can I spend? Now, this is 
we said, we're, this is not even calculus. If I've got $50 coming in, how much can I spend? Hopefully so, but I can't spend more than 50, can I? And so what a budget does is it just puts visually in front of you, I know what's coming in, these are the bills that are going out, and, and if, my, if my bills are like larger than the income, then what do I have to do? I've got two choices. What are my two choices? I've got to earn more, and there are some ways to do that, or I've got to spend less. But I can't just magically expect magic to fix it. Right? The, uh, one of the things that Dave Ramsey would teach is that understanding that we need to understand money man management, it's 20% theory and 80% discipline. It's a lot like dieting. Anybody ever been on a diet? Do you really not know how to diet? Or do you really not know how to be disciplined? I mean, my problem, it's not that I know I shouldn't eat the ding-dong. It's that I don't have the self-discipline not to eat it, right? And that's the same thing that happens to our money. So learning that discipline when you don't have a lot of money will bless you later on as your income grows. Um, the other thing about, if you go ahead and learn about money now, it will help you as a minister be more effective in working with people in your congregation who are going through problems. Married people that fight, what's one of the two things that they fight most about? Money. And are they fighting because they've got too much of it? No. And so if you've learned how to handle your money, then you can be more effective in ministering to those folks who are walking through that valley and needing some help. I, I had one buddy that he said, you know, I didn't, he said, I didn't even want to talk about it because I, was, I had so many problems of my own related to that, I didn't even feel like I could legitimately speak into it to other people. So learn about it now. Um, develop a strong work ethic. Is it okay sometimes to get a job? along with your ministry? This is yes. This is no. There may be times where you need to do that, but one thing I would encourage you to do as it relates to working with a church is uh, communicate on the way in with the church that's thinking about hiring you. You may be looking at a congregation. You'd love to work with this congregation. This congregation has offered you $40,000 a year, but you've done the numbers. You have, the, you, you have it in black and white. You know that it's going to require you $50,000 just to live. Should you take that job? No, why? Yes. And my fear is... I'm. I just realized, Willie, that you're here and so much experience, you, you should probably be speaking into this instead of me. But I'm afraid what has happened sometimes is a guy says, oh, I love this church and God will just make everything work out. God has given us a mind and a brain and the ability to reason. And when the numbers don't make sense, now, so what you might be able to do is go to the church and say, I, I think working with this church would be amazing but we've got a huge difference here. One question is, can you meet the budget that I have here in black and white? This is what it requires. The church says, well, man, if this guy's done his homework and knows that, we might be able to stretch and pay him that. You communicate. But the other question you could ask is, hey, I think I can make a difference here, but what if I went and did some work on the side to make up that $10,000 that I'm going to need? It's worth asking that question because while it flies in the face of free enterprise, there are some churches who think that once they've hired you that you, it is not appropriate for you to go and make any other kind of income. I don't think that's right. But some elders will assume that you know that that's the way they think. And a lot of times it blows up because there hasn't been good communication. They'll even sometimes... And I think this is wrong too. They'll hire you and they will, uh, they will try to convince you that it's not appropriate for your wife to go get a job. And they didn't even hire your wife in that sense. Well, 
because that might be your other answer. Well, I'll take this. My wife is going to be looking for a job. It, it doesn't hurt to ask, are you cool with that? And then you're on the same page. But if the numbers just don't work, sometimes you've got to say no. And so develop that strong work ethic. If you really like the, uh, the church, you might be willing to do some other work on the side to help make that work out. While you're in school here, you may find yourself needing more support. And you may go and ask some churches to help you. But what's another way that you can help raise the support you need to get by while you're in school? It starts with a W. Then there's an O and an R and a K. You can go to work. And sometimes not working with a church can actually bless you while you're in school. If you go to work at Chick-fil-A and your shift is whatever time, 3 to 8 in the afternoon. Between 3 and 8 you think about chicken and you are devoted to chicken, but at 8 p.m. are you thinking about chicken anymore? No, you don't think about chicken again until it's time to go back to work. And you can actually focus on then your homework, your papers, all the things here. Uh, sometimes getting a job is one great way to provide some additional income. Any questions before we close out? Yes, sir. Well, that's a good question. Yes. And, and we could do a long, drawn-out thing on that. You've chosen ministry, and I would suspect you didn't choose it because of the financial horizons out there. Now, it is a career field where if you are good at what you do, you can make a really good living. It's like anything else. You're running your own business. It's Josh Eldridge LLC or Josh Eldridge Ministries. Or, you, know, you need to think of it in terms of, yes, I care about evangelism and yes, I care about souls, but on the other side of this, um, I am running my own business, and then if you're going to have a family, I've got a family that's looking to me to, to, to make sure that I'm making a living that will put food on the table for them. And so you do have to find a balance there um, where, because for the guy in your church that makes $10,000 a month and you making $45,000 a year, when you go in Walmart, does the stuff at Walmart cost him the same thing that it costs you? It does. And so from that standpoint, in, in running your business, um, you may love a small congregation that you're at, but, but you may also realize at some point that this is my chosen work, and I did go to, to school here, and this is what I've chosen to do. Um, but I, I've got a family that needs to be taken care of, and so you may... Uh, at some point pursue a congregation that can compensate you more adequately. And I think everybody's got to find that balance for themselves individually, but you do have to, you do have to think about that. And, and you are running a business. It's not a, inappropriate to think about compensation. Somebody else may be able to, I, I'm fine with group discussion on that. Uh, somebody else may have figured out a better way to, to define where the point of balance is but it is something you have to think about because your kids are going to want to go to college and at some point your wife's going to want a decent vehicle to drive and you know I, I've well I'll stop there any other questions before we before we stop today again in days ahead on issues of finance and those kinds of things please use the resources that are here um, just because it's not happening in a classroom doesn't mean that there's not something to be learned. And, and you're welcome to ask me, welcome to ask any of us that are on the team, or you may have a classmate. The beauty of Heritage is you may be sitting in class with a guy who's taken the same class you are, but he's been a preacher in a church for 20 years. Talk to that guy. I mean, his advice is going to be useful as well. That's one of the neatest things about our school is it, it mixes ministers together in such a great way.
If no other questions, I appreciate your attention. Let's be led in who's got the closing prayer.